Hi guys, before we get started I just wanted to let you guys know that my next graphic novel, The Lie Behind the Star, is in the works. It's a science fiction story with elements of cosmic horror and mystery. I've been working really hard to craft this story and the campaign begins February 2020 on Indiegogo. You can click the link in the description for more information and to join the email mailing list so you know exactly when it launches. Also, just a heads up, the audiobook version of my first graphic novel, Tadia, is now available. When you get the audiobook, you'll get two versions, a fully scored audio drama with music and sound effects, and one with just my voice, whichever is your preference. In exchange for our gifts, which have allowed you to rise up from poverty, granted you wealth and power and respect, we ask but one thing, a simple thing, really. We require your eldest daughter. I don't know if all of you've you noticed, but I never do sponsored content on this channel. So by supporting my comics, you can really help out. Hi guys, it's Quinn here. If you enjoy my videos, consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm really notices me. My favorite thing about the Dune series is how it points out the dramatic shifts that take place in the human collected unconscious over millennia, like the evolution of how the worm is viewed. In the first book, the worm represents an unstoppable force of nature. The worm is Arrakis. Arrakis is the worm. It is the living and physical embodiment of the desert itself. In Fremen culture, the worm is God because he keeps the desert for his people. Shai Halud guards the entrance into their secret realm. The worm is exalted in Fremen society. Enormous, deadly, rageful, yet protective and graceful. All of this changes after Book 4, God Emperor of Dune. Paul Atreides' son, Leto II, took the image of the worm and twisted it. By the time of God Emperor of Dune, Arrakis is no longer desert. The worms have long gone. Only the worm god Emperor remains. Arrakis had been terraformed over the last 3500 years and now is essentially a paradise world in terms of climate. Leto had given humanity a false sense of stability, especially on Arrakis. And this stability and serenity had been enforced brutally. But he had always known that it would eventually end. The desert and the worms would return, but something would be different this time. The worms would be different, as each one would have a piece of his own consciousness living inside them. He did this full well knowing what the consequences would be, knowing how it would change the perception of the worms in the eyes of the new desert dwellers of Arrakis, but also knowing that there was no better route to take. Within 300 years, the sandworm once more will reign here. It will be a new kind of sandworm, I promise you. How is that, Lord? It will have animal awareness and a new cunning. The spice will be more dangerous to seek and far more perilous to keep. Maneo had looked up at the cavern's rocky ceiling, his imagination probing through the rock to the surface. Everything desert again, Lord? Watercourses will fill with sand. Crops will be choked and killed. Trees will be covered by great moving dunes. The sand death will spread until, until a subtle signal is heard in the barren lands. What signal, Lord? The signal for the next cycle. The coming of the Maker. The coming of Shai Halud. Will that be you, Lord? Yes, the great sandworm of Dune will rise once more from the deeps. This land will be again the domain of spice and worm. But what of the people, Lord? All the people? Many will die. Food, plants, and the abundant growth of this land will be parched. Without nourishment, meat, animals will die. Will everyone go hungry, Lord? Under nourishment, and the old diseases will stalk the land, while only the hardiest live. The hardiest and most brutal. Must that be, Lord? The alternative is worse. 
The new worms that would eventually inhabit the new deserts would each be guided in some way by the mote of Leto's being within them. And to the desert dwellers, it would no longer be a protector or a guardian, but an oppressor, a destroyer. This is very much the perspective of the character Shiana, who eventually learned that she had the ability to control the desert worms. By the time of Shiana, there had been a crucial shift. Shai Halud, whose name meant something to the effect of old father of the desert or grandfather of the desert, once exalted, now became Shaitan, a word which literally means Satan. God became the devil. I've actually discussed this before in this video here. And there's also what I think is an interesting literary comparison that I make between a scene in Heretics of Dune and a scene in Dante's Divine Comedy. You can check that out if you want to learn more about that. Now, of course, if you are familiar with the evolution of myths, then you know that myths are often adopted and altered to serve new functions in new mythological structures. Kind of like how Christians adopted the imagery of the god Baphomet to represent the devil. One culture's god is another culture's devil. How myths are regarded by individuals and by society is entirely due to the variables which have contributed to the formation and development of that society. When the worm protects you, it is God. When the worm destroys you, it is Satan. Frank Herbert was obviously very interested in the concept of current events being contextualized within the context of the long view of history. All important events become mythologized eventually. The actual event ends up mattering way less than the myth itself. Let's talk about how Leto II in particular is viewed historically and mythologically versus who he truly was. Though some in the Imperium such as the Tleilaxu and the Priest of Rakis have created mythology centering the God Emperor in some aspect at least as a true deity, most in the Imperium remember him as the Tyrant. And by this point in time, more than 1500 years following his death, many have fled the Imperium never to be seen again. Leto II was the most evil ruler who ever lived in terms of the suffering he caused. But the pro-Leto argument here is that, in part due to the universe Paul, through his actions, set up, and in part due to the nature of humanity to fall in line behind charismatic leaders, Leto's evil was necessary in order to help humanity avoid falling victim to the same kind of evil in the future. Leto did not act out of malevolence. In fact, he acted out of love for all of humanity, but for the sake of love, he committed acts of evil. And this, of course, gets back to the reason why there are no heroes in Dune. Heroes are myths. There are no heroes in Dune, at least not in the indefinite sense. The Dune series understands that being a hero is not a trait one possesses, but a fleeting transitory experience that one embodies for a period of time. The same for the concept of goodness or greatness. This goes back to the saying, die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. You can be a hero for a time, but you could never at all times behave heroically. Greatness is an interesting example, and like the state of being heroic, it is also transitory. One can achieve greatness at some point, but without acknowledging that greatness is fleeting, one can easily fall victim to one's own pretensions. The state of being great can convince one that greatness is a static trait rather than something utterly transient. My favorite quote on this is, The person who experiences greatness must have a feeling for the myth he is in. He must reflect what is projected upon him. He must have a strong sense of the sardonic. This is what uncouples him from the belief in his own pretensions. The sardonic is all that permits him to move within himself. Without this quality, even occasional greatness will destroy a man. Frank Herbert is saying that the most dangerous thing that a person who experiences transitory greatness can do is buy into their own mythology. Just because you are at one time great, does it mean at all times you will be great? Herbert understood that this was something that affected many people. Buying into your own myth leaves you unable to evaluate your shortcomings and acknowledge your wrongs. 
Obviously, Frank Herbert saw this as a problem mainly plaguing those in power. And of course, this fact makes it far more dangerous. A leader who does not have a sense of who they are beyond their own myth is a danger to the society they are attempting to govern. Now let's talk about why the actions of Paul Atreides and his son had such an impact in the first place. Besides the fact that they were prescient, the thing you have to understand about Arrakis is that the planet itself is a wasteland, and yet without it, the Imperium could not function. Paul Atreides' eventual impact on the Imperium is magnified by the fact that House Atreides went to Dune. Everyone knows that Arrakis is the only place in the known universe where spice can be found. Spice production is directly tied to the life cycle of the Great Worms. Spice is essential to space travel. Therefore, Arrakis is central, but this is not all. The reason Paul's impact is magnified simply by the fact that he is on Arrakis is due to the fact that since Arrakis is central to the Imperium, any events taking place on Arrakis have the potential to dramatically influence the Imperium as a whole. Herbert is calling out that the reliance on Spice to sustain the Empire is perilous because the actions of a few on one world could affect the entire Imperium. At the heart is a critique of centralized governments, in a specific sense. When a populace grows to a certain size, a centralized ruling structure will have more and more difficulty justifying its hierarchy. What gives one world the right to rule 100 others? Frank Herbert is pointing out the unjustness of this, but also its danger. By Book 4, the entire Imperium is fiercely ruled and suppressed under one ruler, under one world. When this ruling structure eventually falls, the result is devastating. This is also the conceit of Asimov's foundation, which Herbert draws many of these concepts from. Science fiction authors have created these cataclysmic scenarios, not only as entertainment, but also to warn us of the potential dark places humanity could be headed for. Dune is obviously a heavily philosophical book. There's nothing quite like it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to learn more about Dune or some other awesome sci-fi books, check out my channel. Thanks guys.